Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights is seen as one of the quintessential stories of English literature. Despite being one of the most referenced and well-known pieces of literature today, it was received with hesitation by Bronte's contemporaries. While many journalists and critics praised the talent with which the story was written, there was often misgiving about Heathcliff's cruelty. Indeed, Heathcliff is cruel, as are many other characters in the novel. Yet the contemporary reviews neglect to mention the basis for Heathcliff's cruelty. This violent novel that made adults quake in their boots in the mid-1800s is now often required reading for both American and British students. Like it or not, many students today supplement their readings with the assistance of online study guides. A simple internet search reveals that a student looking for themes in Wuthering Heights would receive multiple sites to visit. Many of these do mention that cruelty from Heathcliff's childhood inspires revenge. They all curiously leave out the one theme that actually was behind the abuse in the first place. The theme that drives the entire plot. The theme that, were it not in play, would leave Wuthering Heights an uneventful manner and pointless book. They neglect to mention race. Before you accuse me of injecting race into everything, allow me to explain. Heathcliff is a man of color. Fans of cinema might be forgiven for not knowing that, as until 2011, every mainstream English language adaptation of Wuthering Heights hired a white actor to play him. Now this isn't some interpretation of dark complexion or tanning as an indication of ethnicity. This isn't even a case where the character is referred to as brown and people go overboard to say the author meant Italian. You can look at my previous video on The Hobbit. No, Heathcliff is explicitly not white. Now the question might be what race or ethnicity is Heathcliff, and honestly, we don't know. We're never given Heathcliff's perspective beyond a few paragraphs, and he certainly doesn't state who his family was before he was adopted. There is no omniscient narrator in this book, and the ones who do narrate for extended periods of time are mostly ignorant white people. Instead, we rely on descriptions and slurs used by these characters along with investigation into historical context and literary themes that may indicate what may have motivated Emily Bronte to choose a certain ethnicity. The prevailing theory on Heathcliff's race, well, let's be honest, it's to pretend that he's white. But the most prevailing theory that is reasonable, and the one to which I subscribe, however, is that he is Romani. I would like to apologize for my Romani viewers, as I will now explain, for those unaware, the history of the Romani. I've met multiple people in America who, in no small part due to our education system, are ignorant of the Romani as a people. So, succinctly as possible, here is a brief and very incomplete history. The Romani, or Roma, are a diasporic group of people, historically itinerant throughout Europe, Western Asia, and Northern Africa. Genetically, across the diaspora, they are related to people groups from the Indian subcontinent but are usually culturally identified without a homeland. While Romani language has been identified to have similarities with Hindustani as early as 1782, traditional European views of Roma origin have been that they came from Egypt, where the most popular term used to describe them gets its inspiration. Americans may be more used to this word, but unbeknownst to some, it is a slur. As such, as to my knowledge, I am not Roma, so I will not be using this term throughout this video, or in general. Beginning roughly in the 12th century, Roma migrated to Europe and faced horrific discrimination and persecution. Listing several examples would take a long time, but suffice to say, experiences include slavery, expulsion, mutilation, child kidnapping, and legalized murder of Romani. Perhaps most famously, the Romani were victims of Porajmos, the attempted genocide carried out by Nazi Germany, which killed around a quarter to a half of a million people. As with gay, trans, and Jewish people, discrimination against the Romani did not end with World War II. Further atrocities include forced sterilization and cultural erasure. Fueling these horrendous acts were persistent anti-Romani stereotypes, often including maysays like child kidnapping and black magic. Romani were often blamed for crimes without evidence to support prosecution, and of course convicted, often with penalty of death. In this oppressive worldview, it may seem unlikely for a white woman in the 1800s to make her protagonist a Roma, but the text, even without interpretation, supports that thought. Heathcliff is referred to by the G slur no less than six times throughout the novel. As mentioned, these are used by white characters, 
but they do reflect that both Heathcliff's physical description and origins of uncertainty reflect a Romani background. Furthermore, Nellie states she believes one of Heathcliff's parents may have been Indian, and he is described as potentially Lascar. Perhaps Bronte was familiar with the link between India and European Romani. I would be remiss if I neglected to mention another common theory, that Heathcliff is of sub-Saharan African origin. While the text does not necessarily refer to him as such, he is described as being dark-skinned. Furthermore, as I believe was first noticed by Majalisa von Sneedern, sorry about that horrible pronunciation, Heathcliff's African origins would relate to his hometown and his introduction. Mr. Earnshaw picked up Heathcliff in Liverpool. Liverpool, in the days prior to abolition, in which this novel takes place, was a hub for the slave trade of Africans. The International Slavery Museum estimates half of three million slaves transported by Britain were on ships from Liverpool. The ability for Mr. Earnshaw to purchase a human being is unquestionably present. Furthermore, Mr. Earnshaw says he tried to find Heathcliff's owner. This could refer to a parent, but it has in recent years been interpreted as a slave owner. Finally, Adam Lowe has noted that Heathcliff is only ever given one name, which was typical for enslaved persons. I subscribe less to this theory, but it's interesting and I wanted to share it. This fact of Heathcliff not being white is important for any reading of Wuthering Heights, as all abuse faced by Heathcliff is racialized violence. He experiences clear physical violence from Hindley, who physically beats him on any whim. He also faces verbal abuse from Hindley and others, like the Lintons, including racist slurs and demonization due to his skin color. The most obvious case of abuse, which is often overlooked by modern analysis, is that Heathcliff was stolen from his family. The fact that he did not speak English is given as an explanation that he must have been an orphan, and was taken without any regard for his relatives. Old Mr. Earnshaw displays white privilege at its highest, believing he has a right to a child of color just because he is there. Subtler forms of racism also appear throughout the novel. Characters call Heathcliff a savage and a demon, but do not call other characters this. Tellingly, many of the aforementioned study guides use this coded language as well. He also experiences exotification from Isabella, who is fascinated with his physical appearance, despite earlier saying his appearance warranted his imprisonment, and reminds her of a fortune teller and a thief, once again implying that he is Romani. Isabella exhibits both a desire and a despisal for Heathcliff's otherness. I believe that without willful ignorance or stubborn arrogance, it cannot be argued that Heathcliff is anything but a man of color experiencing racism. The question then becomes, what does it matter? Why is it important that Heathcliff is the other? Why is it crucial to the story that he is of a different race than the rest of the cast? And perhaps most confusingly, why did Emily Bronte, a rich white woman in the mid-1800s, write a story about a Roma man getting revenge on a bunch of racist, rich white people? Well, for the latter question, we will likely never get a concrete answer, unless some long-lost note from Emily Bronte makes its way into the public eye. Any answer is speculation, but let us consider. Though the Bronte sisters did not own slaves, they did have neighbors that did. Emily also potentially read about debates going on in her country around the morality of slavery, but it is unknown if she herself knew any Africans. Likewise, as one well read, she would most certainly know of Romani stereotypes, but one cannot say whether or not she personally knew any Romani people. However, as she obviously knew of at least some of the historical context behind the struggles faced by these diasporas, it is interesting that her character avoids, and in some cases subverts, the stereotypes common in contemporary works. Here is the analysis that I mentioned earlier. In Jane Eyre, which was written by Emily's sister, Roma stereotypes of deception and sorcery are played up, but in Heathcliff's case, only foolish characters rely on the stereotype when judging him. We know Emily read Walter Scott, and she likely also read Jane Austen, both of whom utilize Romani stereotypes. However, I feel it is possible she also read one other famous work. Notre Dame de Paris was written by Victor Marie Hugo in 1831. It was translated into English by Frédéric Chaubert as The Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1833. There is no record that Emily Bronte ever read this book, but even if she did or did not, I've noticed an interesting parallel between two characters. 
Heathcliff is the inverse of Esmeralda. Esmeralda is a white girl stolen from her family by Roma. Heathcliff is a Roma boy stolen from the streets by a white family. Esmeralda is raised by cruel individuals, scorned by society, but becomes honorable and is loved by everyone that doesn't hate her for her status. Heathcliff is also raised by cruel individuals, but these cruel individuals are rich and white. Society, as seen with the Lintons, deems them as trustworthy and Heathcliff, the victim, even when a child, as a demon. Esmeralda is abused and does nothing wrong, and dies as a result, becoming a famous example of virtue in European literature. Heathcliff is abused and fights back. He defends himself from murder attempts, and becomes known as a villain. Europe's favorite Romani is actually a white woman, stolen by cruel stereotypes from her birth mother, exotified, objectified, and killed. Europe's favorite villain, however, is a man of color, stolen by rich white people to be a toy, an abnormality, also objectified, also exotified, but refuses to remain passive. Traditional critiques of these characters value silence and complacency in the face of abuse, and Cliff's Notes even says Heathcliff loses all sympathy when he defends himself from attempted assassination. But it is not morally wrong to seek avenues away from maltreatment. I also want to recognize that Heathcliff's abuse of the new generation of characters is inexcusable, but it is explained, especially under the context of Heathcliff as a man of color. Elizabeth T. Jershoff's report on physical punishment recognizes that the use of abuse in raising a child can warp their perceptions, causing them to see abuse as legitimate or excusable. Heathcliff faces abuse at the hands of Hindley, and to a lesser extent, Edgar. However, the intergenerational cycle of abuse does not explain why Hindley or Edgar both raised in luxury and absent of abuse, are violent. They, however, are not violent towards any of the white characters, confining their abuse to Heathcliff. Herbert C. Kelman recognized that the abuse of marginalized people can be performed by normally nonviolent individuals, provided they do not see the victims as human. This paper that he wrote was admittedly focused on massacres, but can be applied to personal abuse as well. Catherine Linton and Hareton Earnshaw both emerge from abuse as functioning members of society, but therein lies the catch. Kathy and Hareton are not fundamentally better people than Heathcliff was as a child, and treating them as such disregards the point of the novel. No matter the money, no matter the power, Heathcliff was always a loner, always the outcast. Heathcliff's success was always secondary to his ethnicity in the eyes of his peers. For all of these reasons, it matters that Heathcliff is a character of color. He isn't a good person, but his cruelty comes from the experiences unfairly thrust upon him by the racists in his life. Without that aspect, the novel would seem to indeed be about the cruelest acts imaginable, carried out by inconceivable monsters. And that's why the novel matters. Emily Bronte, in the 19th century, wrote a novel where the crux of the Byronic character's drive for revenge came from actions contemporary critics found unreasonable. Henry Chorley described the book representing only the nooks and corners of England, but he himself held racist views, particularly about black people. American critic Edwin Whipple said that Bronte's sense of depravity of human nature was her own, despite his review being written while slavery was still legal in his country. In multiple reviews, critics believed only a psychopath could commit the acts depicted, when all across those countries, atrocities far worse were being committed by politicians, clergymen, landowners, and debutantes. Wuthering Heights is not, as Dante Gabriel Rossetti suggested, laid in hell. This is laid in the real world, the real world that deemed slavery as permissible, that considered segregation honorable, that believed that race affected propensity for good and for evil, and that in less than 100 years would see a nation murder a quarter to half of the entire Romani population of Europe. Emily Bronte constructed a world like her own, where the acts of racist, rich white men and women left people of color with limited options to achieve power or influence. To ignore this theme ignores precisely what makes the novel real. And reality, even if turned a blind eye to by critics, is far darker than one woman's imagination could ever be.